Many of you might not know that Muslims were the first to really manufacture paper at an international level. That Muslims were the one who spread paper to the entire globe from India to Europe. But they didn't invent it. They perfected it and they popularized it. Where did, they, where did it come from? In the battle of Tal'as in 751 CE, which is in the first century of the Hijrah, under the caliphate of the early Abbasid dynasty, in the battle of Tal'as, Muslims fought against a small group of what we now call Chinese uh, nations. And paper had been invented by the Chinese. However, they didn't understand its significance. And it was something that only the elite did. It wasn't mass produced and the Chinese as a nation still used papyrus. Now papyrus is thick. Papyrus has to be folded up. Papyrus is very awkward to deal with. Paper, as we all know, is thin. Paper lasts forever. Papyrus only lasts for a few decades. The Chinese invented paper, but they kept it a state secret. They didn't want anybody to know about it. In the Battle of Tal'as, the Muslims captured two prisoners of war who were a part of this secret guild of paper manufacturers. New technology. What did they do? They embraced it. They understood the significance of this. So they took these two prisoners of war, treated them like royalty, brought them back to Baghdad, and the Khalifa said, you shall be free to leave back to China as soon as you teach us how to build paper, how to manufacture paper. So the Chinese taught the Muslims the art of paper manufacturing, and the first manufacturing mill in the entire Mediterranean world was set up in Samarkand. There was no paper in Europe at the time. There was no paper in India at the time. The first manufacturing mill was set up in Samarkand. And the Muslims experimented and they produced a better quality of paper. And eventually Baghdad, eventually Andalusia, the entire Muslim world produced different types of paper. Once upon a time, there was Sulaimani paper. There was Dawoodi paper. There was Samarkandi paper. And by the way, the ancient Chinese, they used to call paper Kaghaz. And us Pakistanis, we preserve the her heritage and we still call paper to this day Kaghaz. This, ter this term is ancient Chinese. So we still call paper Kaghaz from the ancient Chinese to show you where it actually came from. Eventually, the government, the Islamic government adopted paper as its official means of communication. So paper spread throughout the Muslim land from Andalusia on the one side, on the west, all the way through Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, all the way through Arabia, Damascus, Syria, Palestine, Iraq, all the way down to the borders of what is now China, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. Paper became the norm. And with paper, what comes with paper? Books, education, universities, institutions, libraries, because paper is the medium of education. And it is not a coincidence that Islamic science has flourished, the writing of books flourished, scholarship flourished when paper was discovered. And with paper came, as I said, the largest universities in the world, the first the first universities and the largest libraries were Islamic libraries. And the fact of the matter is that Muslims were the first to have something that we now understand as being a university. And this is not a, a braggado claim. It is a claim that has been documented by researchers. A famous scholar, uh, George Makdisi, has an entire book called The Rise of Colleges in Islam. You can find it on Amazon. And in it, he documents the first colleges and the first universities were those produced by the Muslims. The notion of adults getting an education was something that Islam did. And of course, it's not a coincidence. All of this is happening with the medium of paper flourishing. The West eventually discovered paper in the first crusade, in the second crusade, when they entered Jerusalem and they found the Muslims with paper, they brought it back to Europe. And Europeans, their appetite was whetted for paper. Where do we get paper from? And when they conquered Andalusia, they found the first paper printing presses they had ever seen in their lives. The first paper manufacturing mills. And this is an interesting fact of history. They expelled all the Muslims of Andalusia, except for a handful who could teach them sciences they didn't know. And of those sciences, they didn't know how to make paper. 
So of the Muslims who were forced to remain were those who owned the paper manufacturing mills, those who knew the art of paper. And from Andalusia, Europeans acquired the art of making paper. And it spread throughout all of Europe until eventually they set up printing, pre not printing presses, paper presses, excuse me, paper mills in Italy. And guess what? The Europeans started making better paper than the Muslims. For 200 years, paper was sold to Europe. Around 1500 or so, the Europeans began producing better paper. And from that point on, many of our manuscripts that we still find are actually being written on European paper. And we see here the beginning of the rise and decline, the beginning of the fall. Paper is coming from Muslim lands to Europe, 1300, 1400. Around 1450, 1500, what happens? The Europeans discover better ways to make paper, better quality paper, stronger paper. So what happens? They begin selling to Muslims. You see the tides of change slowly coming along. And Europe excels in the art of manufacturing paper. Eventually, of course, paper also moves to India in the 13th century. Now, paper is always the sign of civilization and education. Not coincidentally, when paper flourishes in Europe, what happens? The rise of knowledge, the Protestant Reformation, the Renaissance, all of this is happening around the same time that paper is being introduced to Europe. And Europeans have a surplus of paper. And when you have a surplus of a commodity, what happens? You begin thinking what to do with it. What can we do? How can we better utilize what we have an excess of? And therefore, not coincidentally, around 1450, who comes along? Johannes Gutenberg, the inventor of the printing press. And the printing press is considered to be one of the most important technological advancements in the history of humanity along with the wheel basically number two is the printing press because with the printing press what happens well you can mass produce books and with mass producing books you are teaching a generation of people knowledge they don't have to write an entire book by hand before the printing press, if you wanted to buy Tafsir ibn Kathir, if you wanted to purchase Sahih al-Bukhari, guess what? You had to sit down and write it cover to cover. Obviously, that's not easy to do, is it? With the printing press, you can mass produce thousands of books everybody reads. And with the printing press, education, technological advancements, everybody, Newton, Isaac Newton, his book on, the, the, on nature and on science became an instant bestseller. And this is in the 1500s. When the average person is reading Newton, what happens? The bar is raised. Knowledge becomes an easy commodity. And when everybody's knowledgeable, the bar continues to rise. Now, we have the advent of the printing press. This is the second technological achievement we're going to talk about. When the printing press is introduced to Muslim lands, what happens now? This is where we see the alternative model. And that is the bubble. That is the shutting off. 600 years earlier, when paper was introduced, the Muslims embraced it. They Islamicized it. They made it a part of their curriculum. Everything is written on paper after 750 CE. 150 Hijrah, everything is written on paper. Before 150 Hijrah, everything's written on papyrus and vellum and leather. After 150, everything is paper. They embraced it. Now what? The printing press is invented, 1450. Muslims hear of the printing press, but now they have a thousand year history. Now they think that they know everything. Now they're not interested in change. So what happens? Many of you are not aware of this. When the Muslims first heard of the printing press, they banned it. They prohibited its importation into Muslim lands. They said, this is something the kuffar have invented. We didn't invent it, it can't be good. And any printed book was banned. So much so that in 1485, the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid II said anybody who's discovered with a printing press or a book will be sent to jail. And the decree became even worse in 1515. Sultan Salim I said anybody who was found with an Arabic book that is printed on a printing press shall be executed. The punishment for owning a book that was printed was death. Why? There's a lot of reasons my time does not allow me to go into all of them. But 
one simple reason. They did not want to change. They wanted to somehow oppose modernity. They wanted to live in a shell because they were so confident our ways are the right ways. We are the right religion. We have the true uh, teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, so we don't care if they invented uh, paper or the, sorry, the printing press, we're not going to take it. It was enthusiasm that was misdirected. Yes, we are the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. Yes, we are Muslims. But where does Allah tell us not to accept modernity? Where does Allah tell us don't accept technology? But there was a sense of supreme power. There was a sense of arrogance. There was also a fear of the printing press. Everybody's going to start reading. What's going to happen? They will become Sheikh Google and Mufti Wikipedia as we're now scared of in the internet era, right? You ask Sheikh Google for your fatwas. There's a, there's a fear of change. So what did the Muslims do? They banned it. In the meantime, books are flourishing in European lands. Thousands and thousands of works. Not coincidentally, Martin Luther's Reformation utilizes the printing press. He prints the Bible in German for the people to read because before this time, the church had banned the reading of the Bible. The Renaissance is coming right after this, challenging scriptures, uh, interpretation that the earth is flat and the sun is going around the, the earth and all of these changes that the church had put on the people. Scientists come along and challenges. Galileo and Newton and all of these people. Thinkers come along that change and challenge the political structure. What happens? The entire theocratic state, the entire dominion of the church collapsed completely because education was too powerful and ignorance is bound to lose over education. So, Europe was forced to change and the church was forced to cut itself and it became the Protestant and the Catholic, uh, as you know, uh, branches of Christianity. It is amazing, brothers and sisters, that throughout the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, and even the early 1800s, printing presses were manufactured and transported and books were printed across the world, except for lands of Islam. Can you believe that Hawaii and Tahiti in the 1830s had printing presses in their note native languages and you couldn't find a tafsir or a hadith or a Bukhari book printed in Egypt because it was haram it was not right it was you couldn't you could you, there was no such thing the first person to bring a printing press to Egypt was Napoleon Bonaparte when he invaded Egypt he brought a printing press and he put it basically in the Muslim lands it was forced upon the Muslims. The Ottoman Empire collapsed. Egypt was cut away, as you know, by Muhammad Ali. So many changes came along. Eventually, the Muslims were forced to accept the printing press. And the first printing press was around 1840, 1850, 1860, around the Muslim world. And this, this is why if you go to any Islamic library, you're not going to find a printed book in Arabic in the 15, 16, 1700s. You'll find pl plenty of books in English, plenty of books in Latin, plenty of books in Swahili and in Hebrew and in, and in the language of Hawaii. I don't know the language of Hawaii, whatever it is, but you'll find books printed in that language. But you won't find books printed in Arabic. Why? Because we were too scared of modernity. And we thought that if we allow the printing press in, it's going to corrupt the minds of our youth. But what happened? Eventually, modernity was forced upon us because we were too scared to embrace it. And when that did happen, it was too late. Within, within a few decades, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. After that, the Sykes-Picot Agreement carved out the, nation, the, the nations that we all know of the Ummah. We had one Ummah. Now we have, mashallah, 60 members of the OIC. All of this came about, I'm not blaming entirely on the printing press, of course not brothers and sisters, but I'm saying there's a mentality that is reflected. There's a mentality that is reflected that the Muslims were so confident of their cultural heritage that they mixed up religious glory with cultural glory. Yes, we're supposed to be proud, we're Muslims. Of course we are. Yes, we're supposed to be thankful that Allah gave us the Quran and Sunnah, but where does the Quran and Sunnah oppose modernity and change? Yes, we're not going to change belief in Allah, but paper and the printing press? Come on. So the Muslims could not distinguish between that which should not change versus that which must change.